Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to a new screencast lecture. Tonight's topic is asexual reproduction, and we will be addressing certain questions, kind of like we did in a previous lecture when we discussed sexual reproduction. The main questions that we are going to address in this lecture are what is asexual reproduction? How is a sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction different from one another? What are some advantages? What are some disadvantages of asexual reproductions for different species? So let's go ahead and get started. First, we're gonna do a quick review of an important concept. This is cell theory. And there's three parts to cell theory. The first part is that all living things are made of at least one cell. The cell is the basic unit and structure of all living things. So the cell is the basic building block of all living things. And the final part of cell theory is that all cells come from other cells. Here's a clip. To learn how living things reproduce, we must first understand the basic unit of life, the cell. Consider this question. What is life made of? What is the most basic form of life? The invention of the microscope helped scientists develop a new understanding of the foundation of life. It was in 1665 that Robert Hooke, an English scientist, used a microscope to study pieces of cork. He observed figures magnified many times. Hooke therefore called these shapes cells. For the next 170 years, microscopes continued to improve. Finally, around 1838, a German botanist, Matthias Schleiden, reached the conclusion that all plants are composed of cells. Then, the following year, a German zoologist, Theodor Schwann, said that all animals, like plants, are made of cells. More than 15 years later, Rudolf Virchow, a German physician, concluded that the cells that make up plants and animals must come from previously existing live cells. Life, Virchow said, is an unbroken chain of cells extending back to the first living cell. One, all living things are made up of one or more cells. Two, cells are the basic units of structure and function in living things. And three, Cells come only from other living cells. And that's a key point that we're going to be focusing on today, is that all cells come from other cells. So let's get back to it. What is reproduction? Reproduction is the production of offspring. That means more members of the species. All species need to reproduce or they will go extinct. Characteristics. What are some characteristics of asexual reproduction? Now, first of all, we need to recall that sexual reproduction requires two parents and fertilization of haploid cells have to occur. Like, so, so for example, a sperm cell and an egg cell, they're going to combine genetic material and get a, uh, a zygote, that's a fertilized cell, which can develop into a new organism. However, with asexual reproduction, only one parent is involved to produce new offspring of the species. Ta-da! That cell that produces the offspring is called the parent cell. So this is our parent cell, and then of course the offspring. The parent cell produces offspring without fertilization. So that's a main difference between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. What type of organisms employ asexual reproduction? Now, when we go through these, just please keep in mind there are exceptions to all of these things. It's complicated stuff. Uh, really pretty fascinating the more you get into it. First of all, single-celled organisms. Single-celled organisms, asexual reproduction is going to be very, very common. Fungi, bacteria, protists, many plants. It's less common in multicellular animals, but it does occur. Like, for example, a turkey. Sometimes uh, turkeys can lay fertilized eggs uh, even without a male, and those, uh, those, those eggs will give 
give birth to new turkeys, they're always going to be female turkeys. Pretty interesting. Now let's just think about your parents. Uh, let's think about some of the similarities you may have to your parents. Maybe some of the way you look, some of the way you act, uh, your voice. There could be a lot of different commonalities that you have with your parents. I thought these are some, some neat pictures. Mother and daughter may have some similar traits. Grandmother and daughter may have some similar traits. Father and son, more similar traits. I'm just kind of kidding about this one. That's not really my dad. And this is a key point coming up here, though, is that father and daughter may have some similar traits, but they are not, they are not, not, not the same genetically. And notice I put double star here. This is something to make sure you know. This is guaranteed going to be on your test. Asexual offspring are not similar. They're not similar. They are genetically identical to the parent. Yes, they may look the same, whatever, but it goes way beyond that. They're genetically identical to the parent. This parent plant and this offspring, they are genetically identical. Offspring from asexual reproduction are called daughter or daughter cells. So these are your daughter. Here's your parent plant. There are several different types of asexual reproduction that can occur in organisms. First one we'll take a look at is fission. This is when cells divide and reproduce. You get two identical cells. Uh, bacteria is a really good example of this. It's fission allows very rapid growth of population size. Here's a clip. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. That's a lot of bacteria. I already like this graph. Now, you may uh, have wondered why you have a refrigerator. Here's one of the main reasons why a refrigerator is a great thing to have. If you take a look at this chart, this shows bacteria growth under different temperatures. So here are the coolest temperature they have here is 25 degrees Celsius. So the, you can see that the bacteria growth is much slower at a cooler temperature than at a warmer temperature. Here's 37 degrees and bacteria is going to grow much, much faster. Bacteria in general tend to like warm, moist places like your mouth. That's a good place for bacteria to grow. With asexual reproduction fission, the two daughter cells are produced from an original parent cell. That original parent cell no longer exists after the fission. Here's a clip. Millions of these microscopic creatures inhabit our intestines. Bacteria are very simple creatures. Unlike most cells, a bacterium doesn't even have a nucleus. But when it comes to reproducing, Bacteria are marvels of efficiency. When a bacterium reproduces, it pinches in the middle, and then the cell divides in two. Each of the two new cells is exactly like the original one. Bacteria can reproduce very rapidly. Some types divide once every 20 minutes. At this rate, a single bacterium can become over a billion bacteria in less than 12 hours. Fragmentation or regeneration is when a new organism grows from parts of a parent. Now, re this is different than regeneration, say, like if a uh, iguana has its tail broken off and the tail will regrow. That is regeneration, but that's a different kind of regeneration. That's not considered asexual regeneration because it doesn't make a new organism. It's not going to be a, a, another new iguana. Some examples of organisms that do have asexual re uh, regeneration would be sea urchins, sponges, sea cucumbers, planarians, type of flatworm. Here's a clip about planarians. Now this is pretty neat. What you see here, you see the, uh, the planarian, the worm was sliced from head towards tail. 
not completely, so now it has two heads growing out of it. Um, here's one that is separated. It's going to separate itself into a completely new organism. This one looks kind of cute. kind of looks like a uh, Pac-Man ghost. Budding. Budding is when a smaller or a daughter cell branches off of the parent. Uh, examples would be Hydra, yeast. Here's a picture of Hydra, and here you can see the uh, offspring budding off of the main parent plant. Here's a clip. I think this one's kind of a little bit creepy. Here you can see the Hydra. It uh, kind of almost looks like a glove, and here's the offspring daughter budding off of the, the parent. Eventually it's going to get large enough where it can break off and become its own separate organism. Vegetative reproduction. This is when offspring grow from a part of a parent plant. Examples would be strawberry plants, raspberry plants, uh, potatoes. So here would be the parent plant and a, uh, a tuber could shoot through and where it hits soil a new uh, plant can start growing. So a new, in this case, it would be a new strawberry plant will start growing. And this is a real quick, easy way for these things to spread. Um, I know I have some mint in, the, in my front yard, and that does uh, reproduce asexually. And the uh, mint can spread really, very really quickly and go get, get, get all over the place. This is one I've done in my own backyard. You can take a branch from a willow tree put it in water and what's going to happen is eventually a good one is if, if you could do it maybe about a six foot long branch that'd be a good length and the branch will start to root in the water you can see that and then you can take it and put it in a five gallon bucket and it will start to grow and you can actually eventually get a uh, full full uh, willow tree it's pretty neat Potatoes will do this. You probably have had that, this happen at home where you had a bag of potatoes and you just kind of forgot about it and left it in the pantry. Eventually it will start to sprout and it will start to grow. And you could cut out one of these pieces right here and plant it and it will grow a, a new potato plant. Here's a clip. In vegetative propagation, the cells of roots, stems, and leaves of a parent plant grow and divide through mitosis. Tulips, for example, grow from a bulb, a short underground stem surrounded by leaves containing food. As the tulip grows, small bulbs sprout from the old one, each giving rise to a new plant. Most plant stems grow above ground, vertically, like cactus. In some cases, however, the stems store food and grow underground, as with the white potato called tubers. Such stems have tiny growths that are buds for new plants. Some plants, like strawberries, grow from runners, horizontal stems with buds that grow along the surface of the ground. Where buds from the runner touch the soil, roots, stems, and leaves develop for a new plant. One of these methods involves cutting a plant's stem, leaf, or root to produce a new individual plant. In this stem cutting, a branch is cut from a plant and placed in water. When roots develop, the cutting becomes an independent plant and is transplanted to soil. Spores. Spores grow, they're released, and they develop into adults. Uh, kind of like seeds. Fungi would be a, a good example. Now, fungi are, are not technically plants. Mold, they, uh, eh, pretty nasty stuff. I'm sure you guys have seen this, like in your lunch, in your locker. Uh, here's a clip for you. Now, I think this clip's pretty neat. This is a time lapse of an apple that is starting to rot. And here's a fun tip for you. If you ever have sliced apples, you don't want them to go brown real quick, put a little bit of lemon juice on them, and that'll help keep them from turning brown.
Here's a fungus that's releasing spores. Kind of looks like smoke. All of these, this is just thousands and thousands of different spores. Here's a clip. Now you can see this when he hits these, all those spores are released. And if you think about uh, biotic potential, the biotic potential of this would be humongous. Each one of those little spores you can imagine could eventually potentially become a new mushroom, new fungus. But the particles they produce, called spores, are in many ways similar to seeds. Like the birdcage plant, a puffball can be carried along by the wind. But the real long distance traveling is done by the spores that are knocked from it in clouds like smoke. A drip gives them all the energy they need to propel their spores into the air. This is a neat clip. This is yeast, and if you've ever made bread, the uh, you need to have yeast in the dough to get the, the dough to rise. What happens is the yeast, the little beasties, are going to eat the glucose, they're going to eat the sugar, and when they uh, do that, they release gas. They release carbon dioxide gas, and the carbon dioxide gas makes bubbles and puffs up the bread. Let's take a look at this clip. It's pretty neat. So what are the advantages of asexual reproduction for a species? Now again, we're going to be comparing this to the uh, advantages or disadvantages of sexual reproduction for a species. Probably the biggest advantage is that you have the potential for rapid population size growth. Compared to sexual reproduction, the uh, population size of an asexual reproductive species can grow much, much faster. And let's think about why. Why is that the case? And if you remember when we discussed sexual reproduction, we talked that there is a male and a female, and the female is technically the one that's gonna reproduce. So the female can reproduce uh, offspring. However, the male is pretty much a dead end. The male is not gonna reproduce offspring. So only half, roughly half of the population size is able to reproduce versus an asexual reproduction reproduction all of the members of the species are able to reproduce so after just a few generations here here's four generations you can see that the population size can increase at a much faster rate another advantage of asexual reproduction over sexual reproduction is it requires less resources it requires less energy it's not necessary for the parents to locate one another. It's not necessary for uh, a, a, a mate to be courted, like for example, dramatic, uh, amazing mating rituals that birds may have or colorful feathers, things like that. All, all that's unnecessary. So all of the individuals of the species can reproduce without having to waste the energy, without having to waste the resources to find a mate. There's a reduced chance for mutation or genetic complications. This is neat, this is a clip. Uh, one of my students found this uh, dandelion, which is a mutant, and let's take a look at this clip.
Disadvantage. Now, what are the disadvantages of asexual reproduction for a species? And again, we're comparing this to uh, sexual reproduction strategies for other species. The biggest disadvantage is that there is going to be a lack of genetic diversity. Since it's asexual reproduction, all of the members of the species, are, again, if you remember, are going to be genetically identical. They're basically going to be clones. And if all of the members of the population are genetically identical, this could lead to a problem. Let's say that there is a changing environment. So for example, in this case, we have an invasive species. This is called kudzu. This invasive species comes in, it grows really fast, it has big broad leaves, and it blocks sunlight out from uh, the native plants. And if the native plants are all genetically identical and they can be taken over by the kudzu, that would be a great disadvantage for that, that species to be lacking the genetic uh, diversity that might help it to adapt to changing environments. Jacob Schindler is not your typical American teenager. He spends his days battling kudzu. It's an invasive plant that has overrun millions of acres throughout the southeastern United States. Native to southern Asia, kudzu was brought to the U.S. in 1876. It was later used for erosion control by the government. Today, it's estimated to cover more than 7 million acres of land. It kills the local growth, and the only thing that winds up growing is more invasive species. It all began with his idea for his sixth grade science project, to grow kudzu on Mars. What if I could plant something that's really virulent, something that really grows fast, on a planet where there is nothing? But what it really became was, how can I eliminate kudzu in an environmentally friendly way? After experimenting with various gases, he found helium killed the vine, but without harming other plants around it. He modified a drill shaft and hooked up a helium tank. Schindler's work has earned him top prizes in several competitions, and he's been recognized by Congress for eradicating several large infestations of kudzu around the Valdosta, Georgia area. Where we're standing is a place that was once covered by kudzu, right? Right. Where I had the kudzu originally was probably about six or seven, maybe up to 10 feet in some areas, grown off from where the drop off is. That sign was completely covered in kudzu. Now 17, Jacob is working with weed scientists at Auburn University in Alabama to retest his theories in a more controlled environment. Do you see yourself as being a, a pioneer? I see myself as doing what any other scientist does, you know? You do your research and you build on what others have done. And building, he does working to solve a big problem one science experiment at a time. Entire species would be vulnerable to new diseases, other changes in the environment, like for example the emerald ash borer. Uh, in our local park we had hundreds of trees that were had to be cut down and because of this uh, terrible insect that would destroy the trees. You know it's not a it's kind of a pretty looking bug but it's absolutely destructive and here you can see, like for example, in the state of Ohio, they have quarantines. What that means is that you are not allowed by law, and you can get a lot of trouble, to take firewood. Like so, for example, let's say you're here in Champaign County. You cannot pick up some firewood and bring it into Madison County, which is not uh, quarantined yet. So you could bring, if you bring firewood from here to here, you could carry along the emerald ash borer to new areas. And that's the, probably the number one way that these, uh, these little critters can spread causing massive destruction literally across the country, literally across North America. Here's a clip. The emerald ash borer, a tiny green beetle that has killed millions of ash trees in southern Ontario and the northeastern United States. Experts believe this flying beetle, which measures only 8.5 to 14 millimeters in length, arrived in North America in wood packaging from Asia. Well, that tissue in that area is very important for transporting nutrients up and down the tree and transporting water up the tree. And so as the larvae feed, they damage some of those, those vessels that transport the, the fluids, and that eventually girdles the tree and causes the death of the tree. 
Also, the trees in Asia have co-evolved with the, the insect and have developed certain chemical and, and different kinds of defenses that they can use to, to prevent uh, infestations or, or at least limit them. Uh, in North America, our trees don't have those defenses, so they're, they're pretty susceptible to attack. And we also don't have a lot of those parasites and predators. Uh, we have some, and, and they have moved on to emerald ash borer, but they don't seem to be able to keep the insect in check here. We can all help slow the spread of the emerald ash borer uh, by not moving firewood. On its own, the beetle doesn't move very far. Hiding in firewood, though, it can travel vast distances. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Hope you learned something. Uh, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. See ya. Careful, kids. Bye.